You are listening to the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode number 37. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Van Delden and once a week we talk to an industry expert from the wool industry supply chain from farm to fashion and beyond, delivering strategies and insights to be successful in wool and showcasing those beautiful stories wool has to tell. I'm honored to welcome Richard Halliday on the show today. Richard and his wife Jackie and their three children run the Kalawi Paul Marino Stud and Commercial Sheep Flock. Their property is located in southeast Australia and Richard will tell us all about his farm in just a minute. Richard is also the president of Wool Producers Australia, which is the national voice of the Australian wool growers. Hello Richard, it's great to have you on the show today. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, and thanks for inviting me along. It's uh, good to chat with you. Yeah, thank you. And I, just before we now started talking, I asked you how to pronounce your farm, which you said is Kalawi, and then you also explained what the meaning is. Maybe share that with us as well. You'll see a lot of properties in Australia that have Owie in their last, like the O-W-I-E, and the Owie is related to water in the indigenous, like, Aboriginal language. And, the, yeah, so Kalawi is basically the call to water. So... Okay. But there's not too much of that around this year. Okay. Unfortunately not then. Okay. But in general, you would be an area where there's a lot of water? Or? Yeah, yeah. Very, yeah, very... And, look, and we, we sit on an under... Like, we have a lot of underground water, so we don't rely on runoff water all the time. So it's a yeah, pretty reliable area. Okay, that sounds good. Well, now we already started talking, but why don't you talk a little bit more about yourself and how you got started in the wool industry and what your work is, or what do you do today in the wool industry? Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I suppose it started now, when I think back, it was 35 years ago or a bit more when I left school. Um, initially, I came home with my father and I had an older brother working with us as well. And farm, you know, to carry us all, well, I went off and did a, quite a bit of shearing for 14 years. I shore sheep all over the place and, you know, did a bit of farm handing. I'd always come home when it was really busy and shore my own, or our own sheep at home. And then uh, sort of progress from there. So I sort of, well, yes, some would say started at the bottom end and worked up, um, but really enjoyed it. I, I just really enjoyed shearing sheep and looking at sheep. You know, you'd go different places shearing and you'd say, well, well, I really don't want to breed too many like that. Or you think, oh, gee, they weren't bad. Where did they come from? And and that brought me home in the late 80s. I was home most of the time and married in uh, 92 to Jackie. And, uh, yeah, then we sort of older brother went out of our partnership and there was just Jackie and myself and my father and then it gradually just evolved to be Jackie and I. So that's really what got us started. And I've always, like a lot of fellas in our area, do a lot of cropping, but I've always had a real, I know, passion for breeding livestock and just the, the challenge of, you know, trying to get it right. You know, you it doesn't always work out the way you think it should. But the challenge is to try and you know limit the mistakes and get as many good sheep as you possibly can. Okay, that sounds already interesting, and I think we'll talk more about that in a minute. And I I remember I just saw you in the beginning of May in Harrogate at the IWTO Congress, and towards the end of I think a four day conference, you you signed up to visit a British sheep farm because you said it's enough of conferences. I need to see some sheep again. So that already showed your passion. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Like that, that'd be the same for any, you know, sheep producer across the anywhere across the world. That you know, it's just a. I suppose it's my little reality check. I like to go back and see the livestock, and yeah, it. Uh, but it was different to see their sheep. Mine don't quite look like theirs, so I can guarantee that much. Yeah, I can imagine. And I, I, I feel the same because I, you know, sit at a desk somewhere in Germany and um, work about like in the wool industry, but I hardly ever get in contact with sheep. So whenever I do get the chance to visit a sheep property, I just see 
some sheep on the side of the road, I also get really excited. You, sometimes you just need to ground yourself again. And that's yeah, that's true. And at <laughs> the end of the day, the you know that's what we work for. And they actually are like a, you know running a a mob of sheep is really rewarding. Uh, if you have um, you know, we use a throwaway line at times. You have healthy, happy sheep. Well, you don't do you. Use, you usually do fairly well because they, you know, they'll have lots of lambs and grow lots of wool, and that's what we want them to do. So, yeah, they are like they're a great, yeah, they're a great um, leveler. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now talk a little bit more about your sheep farm. Um, you already said uh, you are in a region that usually has a lot okay. of rain. So yeah, talk a little bit more about your the operation you run. Righto. Um, we live uh, basically nearly halfway between Adelaide and Melbourne, so in the definitely in the southeast of South Australia or southeast of Australia. Um, we're what they call a Mediterranean environment, so we have eighty percent of our rainfall falls between April and October, which is you know really makes it very easy to farm. Our average rainfall is around about four hundred and seventy mils, so if you get all of that between April and October, you know, you grow, you grow a plentiful amount of fodder for your stock to eat and you can grow some grain and hay to cut to help them through the drier times in summer. Um, so, you know, it is, look, you know, and be fortunate enough to visit quite a few different areas in Australia and, you, you know, you'll go to some areas and you'll look and think, oh, you know, they're really nice and rolling hills and green pastures, but, They don't have any underground water, which we're like, and that's, uh, well, we have a, uh, best way to describe it is like we, we uh, the upper southeast sits on a, a massive lake, basically, and we drill a hole down into that lake and we can extract water for irrigation or for livestock production, which, you know, is brilliant. You know, we never have to cart water to keep our stock going, which is really good. Um We're a sand over clay or sandy loam over clay country. Um, lots of big trees like hill gums and blue gums and red, red gums. Um, it's we run around about five uh, hundred hectares now, um, mating approximately twelve hundred ewes most years. We aim to mate. Um, I know you've got a question down here that I'll explain that later in regards to the ewes. Yes, um, that split. <laughs> That's split between two flocks. Um, part of the flock is a stud flock. We will breed replacement rams for ourselves and for other people to purchase. And then we also have a commercial flock, which is a, a bit of a leveler for you because you know pick out some of your own rams to use in that flock, and you actually see what they breed like. So the theory is, if you they're going off to other people's properties, though, you know if you they're following practices similar to your own, that they'll breed very similar to what they have. So that's sort of a basic outline. Okay, thank you for explaining all that. And yeah, I, I never actually talked, um, I already talked to a few sheep farmers or wool growers, but I never talked to someone who also runs a merino stud operation. So please explain me how that part of the business works. Okay. Um, well, you know, because it's a small percentage of your flock, it's a really, um, oh, the, the special ones from within your flock make up the stud. Um, within that group, there's a lot of what we call individual matings happen where you'll select um, a particular ram to go with a group of ewes uh, or you'll we'll do, that's where you'll possibly do like AI or ET work. Um, We haven't done any embryo transfer work, but we do some AI most years. So, you know, we might buy um, semen out of a ram that someone else has sold or a ram that someone else is keeping they don't want to sell to try and you know, move our genetics along to where we want them to go. So, you know, being such a small group, you know, the pressure for selection is so high, you know, you'll, you know, um, but we'll do a, an objective, click, click quite a bit of objective data in regards to fleece weights and body weights and 
number of lambs they rear and all this sort of stuff. But we'll also have quite a lot of subjective pressure, like where we'll go and visu visually look at the sheep in regards to, you know, the style of their wool, the purity in their, like, nice, pure faces and whatnot. So you end up with your very best sheep in that group. So they actually, you know, so they drive your, the performance of your lesser sheep because if the top ones keep getting better, it drags the others up, you know, escalates the others up along behind. But it's, you know, it's always, it's interesting because, you know, you might use a ram on his own with a, with a group of ewes and he decides that he's, like, for some reason he's infertile or he doesn't work. Well, all of a sudden you've got a group of ewes that you've only got, you know, a very low percentage out, say 20 or 30 percent, well, you've lost a bit of ground or you remate those ewes later on to try and catch up. So there's, there's, always, there's a degree of risk in it, but there's enormous amount of reward when you you get it right. And, you, you know, you, yeah, we were working with the sheep today and to see some of the lambs coming through was, yeah, quite pleasing. You, think, you know, you sort of ram breeding or like in a, within a your stud flock, it's almost as if you're looking at, um, when you start working with this year's lambs, you want to see what they look like next year as a mature sheep. Even though you've still got last year's yet to sell, there's that degree of um, you know, excitement or anticipation on what they're going to look like. But then you also sell, um, so you breed, like you take so much care in your breeding because then you're, the purpose is also to sell some of the the good, better sheep? Is that yeah, that's correct. Thing? Like in the... Yeah, in the ram side, we aim to sell, you know, as many of them as we possibly can. So, and what you look for there is to have a, you know, like an even line of quality. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you, you know, you buy the dearest ram or the cheapest ram. There's not a, there's a very little gap between them. You know, you try and get them as even and as true to type for your flock as you possibly can. So yeah, it take all takes time and effort and perseverance so yeah no it's good and then i saw on your website that you have these breeding objectives that you summarized with four c's so confirmation constitution consistency and covering what exactly do you mean with that within any sheep flock whether it's a commercial or a stud flock you need to have a bit of a behind making improvement it's a bit like For you, in a, like anyone in their working life, behind doing a good job, you have objectives or you know, a bit of a position where you want to get to. Well, that's what our breeding objectives do for us. They're our focusing point. Like so, when we start to go through sale rams, we look at those. You know, confirmation. Well, that means you know, is he structured correctly? Has he got four legs, one in each corner? That well, uh, he has good balance, which means he doesn't look, you know, he hasn't got a short neck or narrow behind, he's got width and extension of neck. Um, he, yeah, like their mouths are good, their feet are good, they stand up nice and square. Um, they're also within confirmation that they're, you know, they ha you know, they've got all the right reproductive gear that they need. Um, constitution is all about doing ability. So, If you've got sheep out in the paddock that, you know, eat the grass and get fat and do well and get in lamb and have more, they cut a good fleece of wool, well, that's your, that's constitution. They have the ability to do well under all sorts of environments. So they, yeah, bred to thrive, you know, they do well at what they're doing. Um, consistency, well, that's what I spoke about before, you know, to try and, you know, the idea of like breeding a merino sheep If you're bre breeding a merino sheep, um, you aim to have as many, uh, minimise the number of sheep that you have to throw out. So when you class your hoggets, the least the least number you have to sell off, the better because that increases your. That means you've got more consistency. So then if you've got to sell a few extra. You're actually driving that change in the type of sheep you've got. They're, you know, they're meeting your targets better. And the last one, covering, well, that, you know, 
that's just about the covering of wool. So they've got a, you know, good length fleece of wool that's nice, it's good, good um, crimp definition and a um, little bit of nourishment or luster in the wool. So, yeah, and, it, and it's quite, you know, it's just the fact that our name starts with a C, so it's quite easy to fit those key drivers for selection pressure as part of our our objective. So the C's just follow on. So Yeah, and it's like probably also a good marketing um tool, no? It it, it sounds very good when you see yeah. that on your website as well. So Yeah, it does. Or well, it gives you you know, it's some and it's something for us to continually to work for. But it also is good that when you're at times when you want to advertise, it's quite easy to roll them out the four C's or whatever that you you know you've got the and then it, and it gives you like and within marketing you know we have a certain little logo we use which is a, a group of trees and with the Kalawi. so it's just something that when people see your advert they advertising they actually draw the connection back to your your farm and your sheep. So yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And so what are you and Marino Rams famous for? What is so special about them? Uh, they're um moderate to large frame. Um we're probably uh probably a bit solider than a lot of fellas, like um a bit more meat characteristics. Um we're working on a bit more fat cover because fat There's a lot to do with fertility in a merino sheep, so we're doing a little bit of work in that corner. Um, renowned for their ability to cut wool, like our sheep are heavy cutters. Um, and they're between that 18 and a half and 20 microns, so they fit into the apparel market. Uh, we've always had good style in the wool, but, and we do produce a long staple because we're on our own property. We shear our sheep every eight months. Because at eight months we're hitting the mark, like the a good length for the market. So we're sort of that 75 to 80 mil for our fleece wool in eight months. So yeah, that's what we'd be known for. Okay. And if I would want to buy a merino ram, what should I be looking out for? Like I see, I went once to a merino ram sale and and people were really looking at everything uh, into the mouth, into the fleece. So. What what kind of yeah should I what should I be looking out for if I want to buy one? Good question. And the debt, like it's interesting because you've got a when you're looking yourself, you're looking for the environment where your sheep are running. So you know if you're in a like where I am. So if you're here where I am, you look for a sheep that's got the ability to like a medium to large frame, cut quite a bit of wool, has a bit of nourishment, so the dirt can't get in, so we keep as much clean wool as possible. Um, the ewes have got to have a bit of width and space about them because a lot of the older merino ewes end up being mated to a terminal sire for meat production. So, you know, if you're looking... So you need to sort of work out, well, where you are, how much rain you have, what sort of wool does well in that environment. Um, if, you're, if you're in pastoral Australia, you look at really strong on feet and legs because the sheep may have to walk you know, long distances to water. So you want to make sure that they've got that ability to walk. They haven't got, you know, they're not weak in their feet, like uh, down in their pastern. Um, yeah, so it sort of depends about where you are for what you want to breed. So where you are, you'd probably want a, you know, really um, white, pure, super fine type wool that can handle quite a bit of rainfall. In, in yes, Germany. Indeed. <laughs> That's true. Okay, so I, I conclude that if I ever want to buy a ram, I need your advice and need someone to guide me <laughs> because it, it sounds more <laughs> well, complicated. Right. Someone to guide you, put it yeah. that way. <laughs> okay, and yeah, what does a Merino ram sale? Um, I, I think it's, all, is it always an auction type or what? how should I imagine a Merino ram sale? Uh, well, it's, Two main types now. One is uh, like is a called a helmsman, where you actually just write a write your numbers on a piece of paper and they put it on a big board, which takes quite a while to go through the sale like that. Or the other is an open cry auction, and you know the most of your listeners would have um, seen a house sold or something sold. Well, 
that's your open cry auction. You know, they'll just they'll have a basically have a reserve that they've set on the sheep. So they'll try and get a bid as near to that reserve as possible, but hopefully a long way in front of the reserve. And um, yeah, and then they'll just watch the people to wave their hand or move their eyelid or whatever they do, um, nod their head to bid on the sheep and they'll just work their way through a lot of, you know, and that'll depend what sales you have. There could be a anywhere from a 5000 to a 1000 to a $100 bid. So, and depends on the sheep they're selling at that point in time. Yeah, that's what I found fascinated. I've only been to a ram sale in South Africa, but everybody was bidding so quietly and like secretly that I don't even know how the people in front actually saw that someone was bidding. But it seems to be a little bit secretive that people don't really know who was bidding. Yeah, a little bit. Well, you just, yeah, and you don't want everybody else to know what you're doing. So hopefully that day you didn't um, wave to someone in the crowd and take a ram home because they'd think you were bidding if you were waving. So. Yeah, exactly. No, I did not go home with a ram. So. <laughs> Good. And then another question I I have for you is um on like when you look at pictures of shows where people pose with their sheep that get a prize, and also on your website you can see a lot of pictures with you posing with your I guess your most prestigious rams. And how do you get these sheep to stand still? Because sheep in general always run away. So what's the secret? Yeah. Uh, that, I think I actually made a comment in an email back to you. It's, it's about being a sheep whisperer. But uh, no, it's really about... Um, they're a big animal. A sheep and a sheep is a bit like any animal you work with. That if you move around them quietly and show them respect and... Yeah, and those big rams, well, they've been looked after and fed twice a day and everything. Well, you know, they know they got, you're going to feed them. They slowly become used to you as your best friend, almost. And when you're at a show, it's actually quite easy because they know your smells and they know you. So if you go to a show and there's different noises and different people, well, quite often they're sort of much like, well, I'm just going to stick next to you because I know who you are. You know, they're, they're quite happy to be your friend because they don't want to, yeah, they don't want to mix with anyone else. And, but they will. And you get out on the, the show floor at times and with a show sheep and they'll uh, like they'll bleat, but they'll be bleeding to their mates that are back in the pens where they come from because that's their little um, social group. So, yeah, it's no great thing. And it's great to have them quiet. Like, there's nothing better to work with your and you get your rams in the yards and they just stand around and you can wander through them. You're not looking to think, well, is the next one going to run over top of me? Um, you know, that's, yeah, it's nice to have them nice and quiet and makes everyone's job just that bit easier. So there are no great secrets to being a sheep whisperer. Ah, oh, okay. Just feed <laughs> them, look after them, and they love you. So. Okay. so you're kind of building a flock when you pose with them, like they stick to you and you stick to them and then... They feel more safe around Yeah, them. that's right. Mm. Okay. Well, yep. Thanks for sharing that. And then, yeah, another question I had. Um, it's good. I get all, all these questions that I always had about sheep farming and so on. That I can <laughs> ask you. Um, and, you, yeah, you mentioned in the beginning that you have 1,200 ewes. And that was something I, I learned recently, that farmers always just talk about the number of ewes they have. They never talk about the number of lambs or the number of rams. So... Tell me why is that? Why do you only mention the number of views? And how does that make sense? Okay. Um, the number of views is basically, that's a base number that builds your flock. So if you're running a self-replacing merino flock of, we'll say, we'll, use a, we'll just use a thousand, okay? We got to have, have 100% lambing. Well, that means there's 500 like maiden ewes running around that haven't never been mated. But the, the base of your flock is always those thousand breeding ewes. So each year you're looking to mate a thousand. Um, some guys might have some dry, run some dry weathers, but most farmers, when they talk about the size of their flock, they'll say so many ewes. Or some might even just talk about their their farm in dry sheep. So they'll yeah, which gets far more confusing because you're You know, one, one lactating ewe is equivalent to 1.8 tri-sheep. So 
it yeah, it becomes quite difficult. But just to keep it simple for everyone, you just say, look, you know, my flock's made up of a thousand ewes. Well, then most people would know, okay, well, there's a thousand ewes. There'd be roughly 450 to 500 ewe hoggets running around somewhere. So, and most years, at your peak shearing, most years you would shear approximately two and a half thousand sheep from that thousand ewes. By the time you have a thousand ewes, all their lambs and the ewe hoggets get you close to two and a half thousand sheep. So, they're just sort of a base figure to work from in regards to your property. Okay, so wool growers would know how to do the maths and everybody else yeah, now yeah. can get a glimpse of how to calculate this. Okay, thank you. For yeah, that's right, how it sort of fits together in there. Yeah, and, it, and it, you do, like in some areas, there's more likely to be a few dry sheep, uh, like they run a weather, like a weather hoggard or something, but where we are, it's like a breeding country, it's warm and healthy. So we can, what we want to do is run as many ewes as we possibly can. Okay, and explain the terms weather and hogget. Maybe not everyone would be familiar with those. Okay, um, pretty easy. Well, not very easy. Um, a weather is a castrated male, or a hogget is a. So when we when we lamb, we are like a ewe lamb until they're shorn the first time, then they become a weaner, and then they're a weaner through until about their second shearing, and then they become a hogget. So a hogget is basically when they've got two adult teeth, they become a hogger. So, you know, we have all, they're all full teeth of lambs for kickoff. When they get to two teeth, they become a hogger. And then once they get mated the first time and lamb, well, they become a, like they'll become a ewe. So they evolve into the four tooth, six tooth, eight tooth, and then cast for age. So. Okay. And, and a dry sheep is then. Yeah. So a dry sheep is a like a in Australia I'm not sure about elsewhere in the world but a dry sheep is like we call a dry sheep equivalent means if someone says that a farm can carry two and a half dry sheep on each hectare that means there's yeah so you're running two and a half sheep that aren't rearing a lamb on every hectare on the farm so if you're running lactating ewes you actually You just convert that back. So a lactating ewe is 1.8. So you'd be able to run about one and a half lactating ewes. So one and a half lactating ewes and two and a half dry sheep was kind of the, on one hectare. Yeah, roughly. 1.8 yeah. is the lact, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, I yeah, didn't so. know that either. Oh, so, oh, so I'm learning a lot. Thank you so much for explaining all that. <laughs> <laughs> but now let's also talk about so you wear kind of two hats one is your wool growing hat and then you also have this presidential hat because you are the president of wool producers australia and just talk a little bit about the organization and what role it plays in the australian wool industry wool producers is a the national peak industry body representing and promoting the needs of australian wool growers Our membership covers the industry's commercial, super fine and stud breeding sectors. Um, wool produce nationally represented through, in Australia, we have state farmer organisations. So in each state puts a representative to our board. And then we're quite different to a lot. We have three independently elected directors. So we have a, what well, we call for nominations and we have a ballot to elect people onto our board. We'll, we also work to include the provision and advice to Animal Health Australia, state and federal governments on behalf of the wool industry on a day-to-day -day basis through uh, representation on national health and welfare committees. So, yeah, we were, and we also work very closely with the Australian Department of Agriculture and Water Resources on key issues like animal health, welfare, biosecurity, pest management control, uh, natural resource management, trout preparedness, an emergency, emergency disease outbreak, preparedness and industry development, including research and trade. So, yeah, it's quite a diverse little group that we that I chair, so yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of different tasks and um, interests to be represented. And that you do on top of your 
day job on the farm. That's yeah, that's right. And it's look, and it's good because you know we have a have a re, like have a good board and good staff that uh, you know we all pitch in and do our little bit because everyone on the board has a property to run. So you know we all take, we all pull a little bit of weight. And for my period as chair, well, I just sort of you know carry a bit more of a load but you know you know that uh you know that it's my opportunity to chair the group and in the future someone else will be there so yeah i hop in and have a fair crack while i'm there and then move on yeah and you're contributing to the overall good of the industry which is very honorable and you get that's, to go to yeah. IWTO conferences which is also probably always yeah, an interesting that's, that's experience correct. and also Yeah, and it's also, and that's something quite big in my eyes when I started out was, you know, I look at hopefully someone here will stay on the farm into the future and run livestock as well. Well, it's our, part of our responsibility of the current generation to leave it in the, in the best possible shape they can for the next generation to carry on. And then the next generation will, there'll be jobs for them to do for the following generation. So it's sort of a, you know, You know, it's your opportunity in life to have a have a bit of a dip and try and you know shape industry to where you think it should be, or make you know hopefully make some changes that makes it work better for the next group coming through. Yeah, no, that that's a very good way of putting it. That we do need to think of the people and the generations to come after us. So I like how you said that. Now, before we end our interview. Um, I would like to ask you what is your favorite story or your favorite moment or experience that you had while during your career in wool. Oh, Elizabeth, there's that many of them. <laughs> like it's and it's so and it is for me. It's a, I I would struggle to find a favorite one because it's been so um, diverse. You know, I had some great stories from when you were shearing, just the fun of shearing, and you know people you work with and where you worked and, you know, being on properties, we used to shear the kids' pet lambs were a bit like taking someone's small child to have a haircut. You had to be so careful because the, they were all there watching you. It had to be done right. Um, the blade shearing rams at the Adelaide show, like uh, big full wool prepared rams, blade shearing them off. Um, then moving through industry to, you know, the involvement of our own farm and having a sheep that does really well at the show which you know there's some good like nice stories there for me and even to now rolling into sharing wool produce as well there's some tremendous stories from that because i've had the opportunity to meet some amazing people see some places that are phenomenal but really get a great understanding of the whole industry so you know i think i, don't, I, I, I struggle to have a single story but to me it's sort of the whole industry is a bit of a story to me from the journey from the start to the finish <laughs> well it's not the finish yet but you know what I mean yeah uh, okay no it just shows that you're in the right spot and you really enjoy your profession and the work that you do on a daily basis so not everyone can say that about their life so congratulations on that <laughs> yeah and you know to bring that into context um, you know, I remember once talking to a group and They're saying, you know, we all have, you know, have stressful days and whatnot. And like, and I can remember when actually it was when Jackie and I were doing rural business management together, of course. And we had to talk about what unwinds you or what relieves you at the end of the day. And at that particular stage, we had three smallish children and whatnot. And I used to say, well, at the end of the day, to come home and I'd go through the ram shed on the way home and feed the sheep and they'd all be so pleased to see you and they'd get their feed for the night. You'd pat one or two and leave the door and then I'd walk home. You'd walk in the door and you'd have your, the kids would all be there ready to see Dad at the end of the day. And that, you know, that was that was what, you know, brought it all back to context that, you know, whatever happened during the day and whatever you were doing really didn't mean that much because, you know, there was always something at the end that made you smile and made you feel good. Yeah, and all these, um, the sheep and your children depended on you. And I guess that makes you also feel that you have a real purpose in life and that you're contributing. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time and all these explanations. I hope my questions weren't too basic, but um, sometimes we just uh, uh, assume that everybody knows, but maybe not everybody knows these different w words and terms. Yes, hello. Yep. And another great thing I was always told, Elizabeth, is there's never a basic question, because if, if you're not asking it, somebody else is probably thinking it. So, you know, that, and it is like it, and it's great um, for us. We At times we've hosted students here from overseas and it's really great to have someone that you've actually got to explain why you do, when you do it, and what you do it for on a sheep farm because, you know, we all, like, we've all just grown up doing it and, you know, we've changed it or modified it so we do it better, but it's just part of what we do every day. It's the same as you getting up and going to work. Well, that's what you do. So you know what to do in that position, whereas, yeah, we just... We go and look after sheep, so that's what we do. Yeah, no, I, I love how you summarize that. Thank you. And, yeah, how, where can our listeners find out more about um, Kalawi and also about wool producers? Where should they go? Uh, probably the best place to start for both of those is both of those organizations have a website, well, like we do as a farm, and then wool producers and organization have a website, so they... Yeah, they just type in the Kalawi or wool producers. They'll find what I do at home and they'll also find the organisation that I chair on a national level. So, yeah, that's a great thing about modern technology, isn't it? We can find out what everyone's doing somewhere. Indeed. Okay, and I'll make sure to link to those websites also in the show notes of this episode. Well, thank you, Richard. I wish you lots of success with your... Kalawi, Paul Marino stud and commercial sheep flock, <laughs> as well as with your job at Wood Producers. So all the best. Uh, no worries. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. It's been great to have a chat with you. Thank you. Same here. Bye for now. Bye. Well, in this episode, I certainly got a lot of my questions answered about wool growing. I hope you also found it valuable what Richard Halday had to say. Any follow-up questions, you can dive right into the show notes at elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 037. All the links and details mentioned during the episode can be found there. Just visit elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 037. Also, I started a little newsletter that I send out twice per month. In the newsletter, I share my most recent blog posts, podcast episodes and other interesting news articles that are related to wool and the fashion industry. I would love it if you join my mailing list and receive the newsletter on a regular basis. You can sign up at elizabethvandelden.com forward slash newsletter. That is all for today. Talk to you again next week and bye for now.